Hello, Hello everyone. Um, uh, in Mark Flaps and myself are part of the science communication team of the European Society of Biomechanics. I'm Aurélie Levillain. I've just finished the Marie Curie Fellowship at the uh, University of Lyon, and I'm about to start uh, an assistant professor position also in Lyon. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ingmar Flaps. I'm currently at Boston University do, uh, as a postdoctoral associate, and I did my PhD at ETH in Zurich, and I'm part of the uh, ESB student committee, and we would like to welcome. Yeah. yeah. So for the first interview organized by the science communication team, we are happy to host uh, Professor Marco Vicekonti, who was the recipient of the Riskus Medal for Biomechanics in 2021. So in a few words, uh, Marco Vicekonti is full professor of computational uh, biomechanics in the Department of Industrial uh, Engineering of the Alma Mater Studorium University of Bologna and director of the Medical Technology Lab of the Rizzoli Orthopedic Institute. He is one of the key figures of the uh, In Silico Medicine International Community, community and founded the VPH uh, Institute. He is also coordin coordinating the Horizon 2020 project in Silico World. So hello, Marco. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. So during this uh, interview, we are going to ask you questions and talk about your career, your research, your vision of the biomechanics fields, and uh, life as a PI. And okay. we're sure, it's yeah, a big program. <laughs> <laughs> and we're sure it will inspire young researchers of the of the ESV Thanks. community. Are you ready? Of course. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we have a lot of questions, <laughs> <laughs> but let's start maybe with uh, a more personal one and yeah. uh, maybe easier one. Uh, when you first heard that you're the, the next winner of the, the Husky medal, what was your reaction? <laughs> <laughs> so I think I should pretend that I was very composed and controlled, but it was not. <laughs> uh, it was a huge emotion, probably the, the biggest emotion in my career, uh, not only because this is a big honor, it is a career award, so it's a big deal, but also because it comes from this community. I mean, I, I was checking before uh, the interview. My first ESB was in Rome, 1992, the eighth Congress of the European Society of Biomechanics. So I literally grew with the society. Uh, and uh, for me, this is like family, so it's like, getting a prize from your family. I mean, you, you, nothing can be more emotional. So yeah, it was a big deal, <laughs> definitely. Uh, that's very nice to hear. It's very uh, familiar atmosphere here at the ESB. Absolutely. Um, let's maybe uh, move to kind of a bit your career to give the audience a bit of kind of a background. Uh, could you tell us a bit about your career path, where you studied, uh, the stations that you've gone through in mm -hmm. your career, and uh, yeah, what areas you're interested in? Like, I think most like most career, mine was dominated by absolute chance and luck. <laughs> so I was trained as a mechanical engineer at the University of Bologna. After a long trip, I ended up in the same department where I studied 30 years after. Um, and I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. I actually went to work in industry. And then I realized that I didn't like it. So I, w I came back to, u to university with a scholarship. Um, and this scholarship included a period abroad. And I went to work uh, at the University of Florida in Gainesville with uh, Professor Ali Searig. And only when I got there, I realized that he was not interested in my mechanical engineering research topic, but he was very interested about biomechanics. <laughs> uh, and so I was forced to start <laughs> working on biomechanics <laughs> without knowing absolutely nothing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I, I remember the conversation we had the first day we met, and I said, Prof, I, I, I don't know nothing about bi biomechanics. He said, oh, don't worry, we have a very big library here. Um, and, and that was it. After six months, I submitted my first manuscript, and I never looked back, and you know, biomechanics <laughs> has been my, my life, professional life since then. So weird. Um, after the period in the U.S., I returned to Italy, and uh, again, by pure serendipity, I was offered a job at the Rizzoli Institute, which was transforming from a 
one of the major orthopedic hospitals in the country into a research institute exactly mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. time. And they were starting from scratch, uh, laboratories, research labs. So I had the opportunity to, when I was about your age, to create from scratch uh, a research lab, fully funded. I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> uh, so the first year were very much trial and error. Uh, but it was a great opportunity. Uh, there was not much pressure. I could make all the mistakes that I needed. Uh, and eventually, you know, my career developed. Uh, and then, of course, the other turning point was in 2011 when I left Italy to go uh, at the University of Sheffield in UK to drive what is being a major project my research career, which is the, the creation of the Insignia Institute for in Silico Medicine which is something I'm very proud of. <laughs> 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 and then, you know, uh, 2018, end of 2018, uh, the home country called me back. <laughs> and I went back to Bologna, and now I am uh, in a simpler setting, you know, with my much more research group, and I'm enjoying being back in my home country. That's, in short, <laughs> a professional trajectory. <laughs> That's an amazing uh, career path, and being open to opportunities and change seem to be uh, key features of it. That, that is a requirement <laughs> in our job. Uh. Um, you mentioned that you've been also briefly to industry and that you decided it's not for you. Um, what was the most rewarding thing in, in academia for you when you do research? What's the, the thing that you find most rewarding that keeps you in research? <laughs> okay. Many things. <laughs> no, um, I can tell you why I decided I didn't want to stay in industry, and it was because I was bored to death. Uh, I was working in a production plant as a quality assurance engineer, and it was so bored. After two weeks, I already understood everything I had to understand. There was no learning, and for me, mm. it was so frustrating. Um, more in general, I have a very cynical view about our career. I keep telling all my students and co-workers, you, you don't choose this job because it's a good job. It's actually a very bad job. <laughs> You're always paid half of the others, and you work twice the time. So it's not a good mm. job. Uh, you do it because you can't do anything else, because it's what you want to do, because it's your... I, I see a vocational element. So once you accept that this is your vocation, you get along <laughs> with it <laughs> and you carry on and you enjoy the part, which are big. I mean, for example, you can travel the world. I mean, I've seen places that probably I would never visit uh, in my career. Uh, and that's beautiful. And you meet, you work in an incredibly multicultural environment and that's mm -hmm. fantastic. You learn, you know, that the world is not one view or one <laughs> color or one <laughs> gender or w one whatever. Absolutely. And so uh, it's, it I, I was very happy <laughs> 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 in my career. Uh, most of the time, I was very happy. That's, That's good. So your research experience in biomechanics is very impressive, at least for both of us. <laughs> um, if you had to pick one contribution, the most important one, what do you think it would be? Oh, that's a difficult <laughs> question. Um, looking backward, the work we did in the early 2000s with Fulvia Tadei and the other people in my group at the Aristotelian Institute uh, was, was one of the first application patient-specific model for solving a specific clinical problem. Mm. Um, now looking backward, that was a big deal. I, I di we didn't realize at that <laughs> time, honestly. <laughs> but uh, now, it, it, you know, it was so ahead of the time. We were doing digital twin before the word <laughs> actually existed. Um, but more recently, I, I, I very much like the work that I've done uh, my last period in Sheffield uh, with um, uh, a PhD student uh, called Bart Van Veen. Uh, we look at the, uh, we applied the theory of the uncontrolled manifold to the suboptimal motor control, and uh, and I found that that thing very interesting. I I, I like it very much. Uh, it resonates with the work that Massimo Sartori presented mm. just five minutes ago. Mm. This area between biomechanics and neuroscience, it's it's really exciting to me. 
So yeah, it's you actually answer one of the question on my list, oh and sorry. and <laughs> it's a good transition for the for the other question. Um, so I guess you had many ideas during your this research journey. Sometimes these ideas don't turn out the way we we want. Um, so is there one idea that wasn't that was very exciting at the beginning and didn't work out on the the other way around? Uh, <laughs> I would say that n none of my idea turned out how this was. You know, that's yeah. the beauty of <laughs> research. <laughs> Um, I think I, I, I probably want to mention uh, a truly negative experience that I had, uh, which was a really a teaching moment. Um, so the first part of my career, I worked mostly in an orthopedic device, uh, mm. joint replacement. And at one point, we were asked to investigate a, a new type of joint replacement who had um, a modular neck and additional modularity and uh, we did we were very concerned about this to be fair so we actually invented new experimental tests that were were much more severe than the standard test in our in order to try to to pull out any problem that there could be with this additional modularity but no problem came out um, and uh, and so we publish uh, a few papers that actually were saying this type of modularity is working very well. <laughs> there's no problem, etc. And and then what happened that that device actually worked very well, but many other similar devices had a mm. lot of problems. Mm. And all those who pushed those devices cited my paper as a basis, so, uh, and that was very bad. Uh, but, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this story, but uh, we have to accept that a anything we do is just a partial view of s the story. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, s mm, how can I say, accurate and rigorous within the limit mm -hmm. of the scope of your study and then what happens mm -hmm. beyond that is very difficult if not impossible to control so yeah sometimes you go very badly wrong so so on the more positive note what are you the most proud of in your research um well i, I i'm <laughs> very lucky and i have a lot of things that i'm very proud of um I don't know. I think that I feel I was, to some extent, uh, instrumental, of course, together with many other people, to change the attitude around the idea that you could use modeling and simulation as a tool in the clinical practice. I mean, when we started to, do to talk about this in the early 2000s, the, the most common comment I received was, are you <laughs> crazy? <laughs> <laughs> And, and now there are commercial <laughs> products. Uh, so, uh, you know, 20 years after, uh, that, 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 that's a huge change. And yeah. I, I feel very proud of this. I think I gave my little contribution to this. So sometimes you need to be crazy. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Every, anytime. anytime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, great experiences. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, basically being a, a researcher is more of a, a calling, you could say, uh, than uh, a choice. <laughs> if you had to uh, exp like describe your ideal day or ideal role as a PI, like moving on a bit more to the, the kind of daily routine of PIs, wh what would it be? Uh, I don't know. I think there are seasons in, in a career of a researcher. So there is an early stage where you it's all about building confidence, and and that means learning, becoming ultra specialized. You have to become the one who knows ever literally everything about something. Uh, and that's the first phase. It's very absorbing. It's very self-referential. You're very focused on yourself. And then, especially in bioengineering, you realize that you can do 
nothing important alone. <laughs> and then you start to think in terms of team building. Um, and, and then there are different people there. There are people who like to work with small groups, do high quality research, but never manage more than five or six mm. people. And that's one model. And that I, 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 I think it's a fantastic model for some people. Uh, I always had big dreams bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to, you know, <laughs> the biggest possible. Uh, uh, and that for me, the central part of my career was really about this vision of building a large institute around in silico medicine where there was a common base methodological, but then, you know, application in every disease area, which necessarily yeah. require a lot of people with different mm -hmm. expertise. And, and, and that was finally, after many years, uh, was a dream that became a reality in Sheffield with the Insignia Institute. Now is more, uh, you know, I'm going toward the end of my career, uh, it's more about um, legacy in, in the intellectual sense. So I'm very fond of teaching. I like very mm -hmm. much teaching. I, I'm putting more and more time in teaching and both at the undergrad and at the PhD level. Um, I, I, I'm coordinating a um, doctoral school at the University of Bologna and I like it very much, you know, thinking how we can better train our PhD students. And I, I, I'm supporting the development and the career of a handful of researchers, of young researchers in my group. That, for me now, that is the most important thing, trying to be a nurturing figure uh, toward the end of the career. That's nice. You've already mentioned a couple of aspects of uh, PI life, basically. Um, could you maybe give our audience a bit of a glimpse into what, what does your daily day look like? I imagine it's not like the movies where the scientist is behind the test bench <laughs> all day. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, when I was in Sheffield, I was joking that I spent all my life l learning and then I ended up working six hours per day with Excel. <laughs> you are in an administrative <laughs> job, that's what you do, you do. You crunch number all day long. Um, well, my, my average day, I don't know. I, I'm an early bird, so I wake up very early. My coworkers know that the earlier the first email arrive, the more stressed I am. <laughs> there is a linear correlation. Uh, so they have this joke, Marco wrote me at four o'clock <laughs> <for him today. laughs> um, But yeah, I start very early. Uh, I handle my correspondence. Uh, um, when I can, I do some exercise. And then I go in the office. Uh, uh, usually I have quite a few meeting aligns in the diary, but, but I always try to have some time to pop in the lab and watch over the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so like I, I can learn actually <laughs> things that you know my, my co-workers do with their own hands and uh, that's good. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, it this two years <laughs> has been stupid because that we were in isolation. So <laughs> not, but normally there is al also a lot of you know traveling, attending meetings, uh, conferences, that's also an important component. Um, if you're you're not at work, you mentioned you're an early riser, um, like what is your typical, let's say, uh, balance to, uh, to work if on a very <laughs> personal note? I am a horrible role model. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, I know the work-life balance is a hot topic, especially in academia. I I have a kind of an unpopular view on this, um, uh, although I, I admit this is a very personal view. I don't expect this to be universalized. I do recognize there is a problem uh, with our job, uh, but I also believe that to be excellent, you need a certain amount of obsession. Now, obsession mm -hmm. is very unhealthy for your mind and for your body and for your private life. Um, so you have to strike a deal and find a balance between these two extremes and each one of us has his own way. I don't think there is 
an experience that can be universalized. I mean, it's uh, maybe the only thing worth to say, we all struggle. We all struggle. That's that's a condition, and you have to be aware of it. One thing I keep saying to my student is, if you were uh, a blacksmith, your injury would be you know hammering your toes or things like that. Uh, you're working with your head, so mental health is your problem, and it's true. I mean, we we do very very stressful work, and mental health uh, is always something you have to w consciously monitor on yourself. Because it can be dangerous at a certain moment. Uh, Certainly. And, and in some cases, you have to accept that maybe you're not cut for this job. Uh, and there are much more easier way to spend your money. <laughs> <laughs> uh. On the maybe struggles a bit of uh, life as a PI, uh, could you maybe quickly comment on how, how COVID, like uh, it's on everybody's mind, how it affected your, your daily routines and uh, yeah, your, your life as a PI? Yeah, my wife hates me because she said that I'm the only human being that was never affected by COVID. <laughs> 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 and the reason is I, uh, because I'm, I'm a lazy cat, so I love to stay locked up in my flat <laughs> <laughs> between the coach and the TV. <laughs> and the second reason is because working in a hospital, um, I had mobility permission, mm. okay. even in the deepest of the lockdown. So I actually always went in the office every day I, so I, I really didn't feel, I mean, compared to some of my friends in Sheffield, we were uh, out of the office for like six months. Mm. Uh, for me, it was much easier. Um, I was very worried about the mental health uh, of the group. So we, for example, we organized, this is very Italian, we organized um, an online coffee Every day. It's not lunch. only Italian. No, but coffee thing, you know, and, and the lunch and then the social. Uh, after lunch, we would meet online, all the group. Uh, no, no talking about work, only s saying silly things, and uh, but to keep a sense of, of group uh, yeah. uh, and fight a little bit the isolation. But yeah, no, it was not particularly good. But, but I, I know that for many, many of us, it's been very, very difficult. And I think we still see some of the scars, even in this conference. I mean, not everyone is here, and some, I don't know. I found funny the way we are handling the mask, for example. Mm -hmm. Nobody wear, but then someone start to put mask in the middle of no, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I think we're very confused, all of us, right now. And uh, I don't know, but it seems over, so finger <laughs> crossed. <laughs> So now we will ask you a series of lighter questions mm -hmm. to get to know you a bit more outside work. Yeah. So we'll ask you two choices question yeah. and you'll have to answer as spontaneously as possible yeah. without justification, just yeah. pick one okay. answer. So are you a cat or dog person? Dog. Well, you answer this one morning or evening person? Oh, morning. <laughs> All the way morning. <laughs> tea or coffee? Uh, tea, actually, yeah. I'm a weird Italian. <laughs> I'm <very fond> of <laughs> tea. Um, <laughs> Italy or UK? Both. <laughs> For different <laughs> things. Private life, Italy. Work, UK. Okay. Pizza or pasta? Ah, uh, no, that's <laughs> not a question at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're forcing me in a corner. <laughs> I reject the question. <laughs> okay, I will leave uh, Ingmar to take continue. over. <laughs> mountain or beach? Beach. <laughs> all, all the life beach. I hate the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, slopes, <laughs> cold, <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Socializing with friends or family time at home? Bring the family and the friends together and have <laughs> a beautiful <laughs> dinner. It's a big part. I count that as socializing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, imagine that also uh, addresses the next one. Introvert or extrovert? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, PhD or postdoc, what did you prefer? What do you mean? Your own experience. Um, yeah, no, it, it doesn't apply. M my story... 
when I started my career in Italy, the PhD as such just started, started very late in it. In fact, we are the one who call doctor the people who have mm. a master. <laughs> huh? um, uh, and it's still like this. When you graduate in Italy with uh, a magistral title, which is the, 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 ma the equivalent of mm. a master, uh, y you are called doctor, doctor in engineering. And then when you get a PhD, they don't know how to call <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> you research doctor. <laughs> it's not a title. And um, at that time, I, I, I started my PhD while I was already working as a researcher in Rizzoli. Okay. So it's never really been a PhD mm. experience like the one that you've done, guys. So it's not really so yet post off because that's <laughs> what I would recommend. <laughs> uh, and then a last one that is not really a, a choice uh, question. Uh, in an alternate universe, what would be your research topic? Ooh, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> ah, beautiful. Um, Animal biomechanics, you know, those who look at the beetles and the, and the octopus <laughs> and I don't know, I found <laughs> it fascinating. So not far from here, but, uh, <laughs> but oh I, I would love that, yeah. Um, okay, with this we would like to come back kind of again to more, uh, let's say, serious topics. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of experience in biomechanics. Uh, we'd be interested um, in your opinion, basically, where what the future holds. So if you could give us a perspective kind of biomechanics 20 years from now, what do you envision? Ha. Huh. <laughs> 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 Not an easy question. So let's start from my comfort zone. Um, uh, in silico methods, we'll keep expanding and becoming pervasive. We will have to bring in silicon method in the curriculum. Um, again, we will have this problem that, you know, any curriculum cannot be made more than a cer certain number of hours. And mm -hmm. so I think that we will continue to have this separation between specialists and people who have a more horizontal training, uh, you know, the true bioengineer <laughs> knows a little bit of, of everything, <laughs> a little, <laughs> little bit of nothing in a way. You know, but uh, because they are the interface between specialists, okay? Um, so in silico will become definitely a, a, a growing area. As I was mentioning earlier, uh, and Massimo Sartori keynote was a perfect example this morning, um, the, the territory between musculoskeletal biomechanics and neuroscience, it's going to be huge in the next few years. Um, on the computational science, I see uh, as the hype for artificial intelligence will cool down, we will finally start to use the best in both worlds and have uh, gray box techniques and, you know, mm -hmm. physics inform AI, all these hybrid approaches mm -hmm. that actually you pragmatically choose the best modeling technique given the problem at hand, that will grow, which requires that we retrain and train and retrain because a mm. lot of, I don't know anything about mm -hmm. AI method, honestly. Mm. I, I, uh, I have a very vague understanding and a lot of people are like me in this community, so we need to grow there. What else? Um, I think there is general digital health revolution at the door, but we are incredibly not prepared for this. So uh, I think we, we need to push into the, 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 the mindsets of the professionals that there is more technology in a hospital today than almost anywhere else. In spite of that, there is mm -hmm. the smallest number of engineer anywhere, mm -hmm. and that's wrong. This is not <laughs> working. We need to change, you know. I, in, in Italian healthcare, engineers are, for the same degree, same level, they are the least paid professional. Uh, and then they complain because they cannot find the engineer to work in the public <laughs> hospital, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there is this contradiction, which I think will, but if this can be overcome, digital health can really transform healthcare, you know, hugely. You know, wearable sensor, uh, telemonitoring, mm. Uh, mm. 
spatial-specific modeling, digital twin, all these things can do amazing transformation and direction. That's amazing. Um, with uh, kind of that view of the future, we would be interested in a bit your mentoring uh, perspective and advice. And I'd like to start by, by asking you maybe for a brief glimpse into what you consider scientific excellence, if you had to define it in like a few words. Mm, that's a difficult question. First, I, I s for a bioengineer, uh, I see two trajectories that, that they are not separated. There is an, a continuum in between, but they are kind of too extreme. So we do science to increase the collective knowledge about the world. We could call it fundamental science. I don't like it, but you know, you work to increase mm -hmm. knowledge, mm -hmm. or you work to solve problems of humanity. And you usually do this by using the knowledge that is being accumulated and resisted falsification, okay? And these are very, very different way of working. I, I, I always being a very applied scientist. I, I, I don't have any academic dignity as a fundamental scientist. I, I tried to write an ERC once at the very first call. It was horribly rejected. <laughs> And I decided that was not for me. <laughs> 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 but, um, but of course, I, I, I don't understand the debate between basic science and applied science. Without basic science, there is no knowledge. We cannot. Go. So the two things sh mm. should progress hand in hand. But the approach is very different. And mm -hmm. so you need to understand where you are in, in the spectrum. Uh, where There is also a point of attitude. I think there are people who are more focused on the detail and, and you know, uh, kind of obsessed by um, s digging deeper and deeper and deeper uh, and other that receive a huge gratification by seeing their work used. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's also the, the there is a different psychological mm -hmm. background behind. So this is one first divide. Uh, and we're lucky because as bioengineer we can do both. I mean, it's uh, we, we both doors are in principle open at the beginning mm -hmm. of your career. For the rest, uh, I don't know. I mean, supervising is it? It's a uh, first and foremost uh, a human relation exercise. So I, I don't have a VCP. I mean, uh, depend who you who you have in front, mm -hmm. uh, how you. you you know, remember, I it's a relationship. It's a human relationship. So you can be you, but just because you're in front of somebody, you, you behave differently. It's yeah. uh, it's it very difficult <laughs> to. So you you try your best, listen, yeah. good people. Maybe related to that, do you have any kind of uh, advice on how you pick the people that you work with? I mean, that's very much related to uh, <laughs> communication, uh, interaction. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um. I don't trust my ability to judge people through an interview. So pragmatically, yeah. whenever I can, I offer a short-term placement or mm. contract. Right. Um, because I learned that, you know, there are people that shine at the interview and then they are very disappointing and vice versa. People that seem, to, I don't know, I don't, I don't trust. It's a moment. It's a performance. Mm. Uh, uh, maybe there are people smarter than me that use this performance to, to <laughs> discover the secret of the personality, but I, it's a chemistry. And again, remember, w we do group research. So sometimes it's not only the chemistry mm. between you and your collaborator, but it's also how this person fits in the group and, and, and the group dynamics that develop. So it's complicated. You have, so my general, my strategy is always to recruit people of course, you know, you, 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 you look at the publication, you, mm -hmm. you look at the, the, the training, uh, the solidity of the background, where they come from, th these are obvious things. But uh, beside that, I tend to hire people and then, you know, if they are not happy and if I'm not happy, uh, maybe I support them to go elsewhere, but uh, uh, that's my form mm -hmm. of selection to some extent. That makes sense. You already mentioned uh, publications and like uh, background training. Um, 
in general, it seems like the criteria for obtaining, for example, a PhD degree can vary from place to place. Mm -hmm. You've been to several. Uh, could you give us some insights into what your criteria are for now you're ready to, to get your PhD? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, paradoxically, I think I like uh, the Italian system, which some country has, which is essentially fixed at time. So you mm -hmm. have three years, and that's it. <laughs> and your thesis is what you've done in three years. And it can be very little, or it can be a lot, but that's it. Um, the idea that you work on your thesis until it's done, which is other system, you know, the Dutch, mm. the, the American to some extent, um, it's never done. That's true. <laughs> Have you research ever had a feeling in your no. research? <laughs> okay, the problem is solved. Then. No, I, I, I don't know. Maybe in other fields yeah. it's different, but in ours, I, I, I think it makes sense. You know, you give, if you have a three years, mm. plus minus six months, there are extension, but uh, usually our system is quite rigid in this sense. And that's, you do the best you can in that period, and, and you'll be evaluated for what you've done. I mean, and do you think three years is the correct amount of time, or would you do more or less? It's the, it's it's the time. Again, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 30,000 years would be the perfect time, <laughs> you know, but uh, <laughs> no, I think it's all right. I mean, there, there's also a problem of career, you know. In already in, in Italy, uh, finally, after many struggles, now we have a reasonably structured academic career, so you have three years PhD, up to six years a postdoc maximum. Mm. If you you cannot be a postdoc for more than six years, mm -hmm. okay? Which means that by that point, if you haven't jumped to the next stage, you have to leave academia. And then you have six year as a uh, lecturer. Mm. Uh, and if you don't become a professor in s within six years, you have to leave academia, which is very hard and difficult. And, you know, I appreciate that. But at least it, you know that in 15 years, either you make it or yeah. break it, yeah. but, but it's a fine time. I, I've known people who been hanging for a thread all their life, and they ended up being yeah. 50 and being still precarious, and that's what's horrible. I mean, it's maybe in that context, could you give us uh, maybe your perspective on the postdoctoral period? How do you see kind of this? period after your PhD and your PhD have a defined topic kind of that you work on and it feels like the goals are clearer what do you how do you see the postdoctoral period and how long is ideal you just mentioned six years is the maximum that, and that's the low <laughs> 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 not my number it's not my magical <laughs> number um, so for me the postdoc is uh, is the trajectory that moves you from being a student to being a professor in a way you know mm. from someone who is mostly interacting to learn to someone who is mostly interacting to teach and to guide you know and it's a very complicated transition You have to develop independence, uh, but that's very difficult in our system because usually you are hired. I mean, I hire a postdoc because I have a grant. The grant mm. comes from a project. There is a pl work plan. So you come to work with me. You have to do the work <laughs> that you're being paid <laughs> for, and, and w which makes sense. I mean, uh, and no, nobody would expect differently. But ideally, you should find the corner in your time in your you know 17 mm. hours per day of work <laughs> uh, <laughs> a corner of time where you start to develop your own uh, idea for example one thing that I'm doing when I recruit um, a, a foreign postdoc I, I offer them to write um, a Marie Curie because you, mm. you can apply in the country where you are mm. if you haven't yes. lived for for more than two years, you know, mm. um, but that um, they're already funded, so I I have the money to keep them, but that is an exercise I in grant writing, you know, 
uh, so it's the first opportunity they have to to align their ideas and to do some I think it's a very useful exercise um, I don't know I think we should another thing I, I'm currently uh, in the uh, board of a, of a bank foundation in Bologna which among the other things funds locally research I'm responsible mm -hmm. for research funding and I'm I'm steering both toward providing um, postdocs or very junior lecturer seed funding. So little money to explore an idea before it is ready for mm. a full proposal, you know. That's nice. Um, I don't think there is much opportunity for those things, but that's mm. where I don't know if I answer your question honestly. No, I got lost. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think it was a good perspective <laughs> on, on the postdoc <laughs> period. Uh, maybe related to kind of the PhD postdoc time that we have just talked about. Uh, what do you see as common like mistakes, pitfalls that you have seen people make if when they pursue a, uh, a career in academia? Basically, what sh what you should you avoid? <laughs> No, it's an infamous list starting from all the mistakes that I've made. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's tough. <laughs> Probably the, the largest number. Um, uh, okay. Um, I'm picking one not because it's the most important, but it's because it is the one that I have problem with right now. Um, I think that there's been a generational shift from when I was postdoc today mm -hmm. um, which has very strong historical uh, socioeconomic determinants it's not actually the case I belong to a very optimistic generation you know everything was easy life mm -hmm. was you know, economic boom after the world was still pushing and you know, I, you know you were an engineer I had like 11 offer a, a job before I graduated. Very <laughs> <often>. <laughs> we were very enthusiastic. We were not scared to any, it, which means that we were very prone to do stupid things, you know, because we never really thought through. Uh, we jump in the fire without thinking too much. You, I mean, your generation have a very different attitude. You're terrified by the future. Uh, and, and so you, you tend to be exceedingly careful. Um, it rightfully so. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not criticizing. I, it just the context has mm -hmm. changed. Okay, so it's not your fault. Or anything. But one effect that I'm noticing is that um, I see is becoming more difficult in some of the people who work with me to accept the limited scope of a single research activity. You're not finding the truth. The truth, <laughs> first of all, in science, the truth <laughs> as, as, a, as no capital T. Okay? <laughs> There's never a truth. There are many truths. But the little truths that we find in science emerge from the debate. So the truth comes out when you send your paper and some reviewer destroy you. That, that's where the truth comes out. It, it doesn't matter how long you thought about this in isolation. It's only when you confront with your peers mm -hmm. that some element of truth might emerge. I see some of my coworkers find this difficult. They will always say, no, but I, I don't think we're ready. We should work more on this. And I, I keep saying, no, y you do some work and then you share. And then mm -hmm. the other will tell you if it's a good work, it's a bad work. Of course, this implies that you have to accept the criticism. Uh, of course. I don't know if you noticed, but there are very few questions during this conference. Uh, Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> that's very bad. We, we, we mm -hmm. have to challenge each other, but in, mm. in a nice way, don't get me wrong, yeah. but I have a feeling that sometimes uh, there is a perception in, uh, in our younger community that if you ask a difficult question, y you're aggressive, you're looking for the conflict, 
That's not the case. Mm. That's science. Science is the debate. You know, it's, it's not your idea. It's an idea. It might be good. Might be wrong. You throw in the <laughs> middle of the, uh, mm. of the table and see what happens. Uh, I don't know. That, uh, just <laughs> being central to my thinking <laughs> recently. So. I think that already went nicely in the direction of the next question that I wanted to ask, which Sorry. was actually <laughs> <You're> spoiling. <laughs> 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 it, it nicely fits into each, uh, the questions into each other and your answers into them. Uh, if you had to give advice to uh, your early career self, like 30 years uh, <laughs> earlier, what would it be given all the experiences that you've had? And I mean, you just yeah, already basically gave a question, uh, an answer. I would give one big advice, but uh, I don't think it would be of any use to <laughs> anybody else. <laughs> and that so would this be is for the next <laughs> question. <laughs> 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 Leave Italy earlier. Um, I, I had a very difficult time uh, before leaving Italy. Uh, and after I did it, I, I realized that I should have done it earlier. Of course, there are also, you know, private life determinants. Uh, we, we're not monads, you know, we're part of a family. We have, especially if you get older, you have children, you have relatives, etc. So the equation is not always easy. But, um, if I would, let me try to universalize this. Um, if this is what you want to do, if this is your your vocation, if this is really important to you, um, you go where they let you work, uh, where there are the opportunities. It doesn't matter if it's next door or if it's five thousand miles away. Uh, you go because you have to. Because what matters is that you are able to to, to push your research, to push your vision see your dreams to become reality that's what what really is important and uh, that's probably the advice i would give to my younger <laughs> 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 i imagine that's still the advice that you would give to younger researchers nowadays as well or would you well um i'm much more careful with them because i to them i tell them they they have to understand what are their driver what are their motivations mm. for me i knew that <laughs> you know that was <laughs> what i want really in my life that was the most important yeah. thing i wanted so i was ready to pay any price for that but that's not true for everyone so i i i think probably the thing i tell them mostly is as you experience this listen to your s w one joke that I, no, it's not a joke he said it's how do I how do I call it? A, a, a mind experiment? I say, could you imagine yourself in five years' time doing anything else mm. than what you're doing now? If you can, probably you know, that's not the best career for you. If you cannot, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're stuck here and that's it. That's <laughs> try to make the best. <laughs> that's an interesting question to ask. Maybe as a last on the mentoring uh, side. If you had to give advice with respect to building network, which is very important nowadays, kind of since we're all collaborating and that makes our science better, what's your advice for young researchers on how to grow the network best? <laughs> 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 you, you're asking to the wrong person because <laughs> I, I'm a fanatic. You know, I I uh, I was two years in, in in my research career. I was already sharing model with the International Society of Biomechanics, the old people who remember the finite element mesh repository that <laughs> I organized from Bologna and was sharing. All my life has always been about r networking, road mapping, building community, <laughs> uh, serving in the European Society of Biomechanics at all possible level and role. So for me, uh, this has always been a hugely important component of my career for two reasons. One, personal, because I'm an extrovert and I receive energy from the mm -hmm. other. So w working with the other makes me strong, makes me better. Uh, um, but the other is that uh, I think that 
the few times where we were able to speak with one voice and get organized, etc., we facilitated the transition of engineering in general and biomechanics in particular from a niche community to a mainstream community, which is what I experienced. I mean, I told you my first ESB was in 92 and we were, I don't know, I don't, I don't remember the number, but we were probably, I don't know, 100, 150. And there was everybody in biomechanics <laughs> in Europe. Yeah, because Rome was a beautiful, beautiful place. <laughs> everybody came. And we were like four cats and two dogs. I mean, that was biomechanics. I mean, it's, uh, we have this joke. There's this picture of the, the founding members of the European Society of Biomechanics, 1978. Uh, I don't know, like 12 people. And, and that was biomechanics <laughs> at that time in Europe, you know, those 12 peoples. Uh, so, and now uh, biomechanics is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Beside the conference, I mean, uh, there are courses. Uh, th there is an industry around biomechanics. Mm -hmm. It's an industrial sector to some extent. So this transformation is speaking. Mm -hmm. And one of the reason of this successful transformation is because in a few situations we were able to speak with one voice and have a common vision and push this vision in the society. So yeah, very important. So uh, you said it's the society of biomechanics is growing. We had uh, we have a lot of students and postdocs. Some of them will work in biomechanics for the next 20, 30 years or maybe even more. So I would be happy to have your 20, 30 year perspective on biomechanics. And in particular, you've had this uh, vision of the um, virtual physiological human for a while. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about it and where do you see it uh, going in the next years? Yeah, I thank you the, for this question because it gives me the opportunity to start to share a new idea uh, that together with some friend we're cooking. Um, so in this conference we discuss a lot about digital twin in healthcare, mm -hmm. patient specific models mm -hmm. that are used to support the diffusion um, this thing is growing, but not, not as quickly as it should, in, a, in my opinion. So we did an analysis and we identified seven major barriers, okay, and uh, which are related to technology, mm. training, uh, acceptance. Uh, I mean, there are many dimensions. And so we started to think what we could do to overcome his barriers and the idea that starting to consolidate is something that we tentatively call the human digital twin mm. uh, which will be a shared collaborative infrastructure made directly and primarily not of model but of data uh, which should speed up the development of the digital twin technology and their validation. Mm. Um, we heard last week that the European Commission funded a uh, support action uh, called EDIT, uh, led by Elisabeth Geris, that will start uh, in a few months. Uh, we will call all of you. <laughs> to join in, in the road mapping for this new vision, uh, but I'm really, really excited about that. I think this, this could be the big deal. And, and that will open the door for all experimentalists to the in silico revolution, because really, you know, they are the one produced data. So that's, that's where the funding, uh, good part of the funding should go uh, in the next few years, to do high quality data, uh, which are indispensable start to develop and validate the next generation technologies. So. And what do you think is the biggest uh, hurdle for the development of these uh, technologies? Like, I don't know, doctors' confidence in the technology or validation data? I know you had a lot of work about validation, verification, and this kind of methods. Yes, these things mm. are all important, mm. but I want to point another problem. Uh, because I think this is going to be critical. Um, in my career, I've seen hundreds of colleagues 
sitting on very precious data because they mm. thought that having this data would give them a competitive advantage in terms of funding mm. of career. It did not give any advantage <laughs> to them, <laughs> but in the meanwhile, those data become obsolete and useless. Mm. And it was a huge waste for everyone. Now, beyond the open access rhetoric, which somehow was imposed to us from a political agenda, you're using taxpayer money, give us back our the things we mm. paid for, which I don't like because that's not the spirit of the science. We're giving you back knowledge. <laughs> it should be more than enough. But um, I think that we have to make an effort in our community to, to find ways so that you produce a piece of data which is useful. You have to make it available to everyone. And we, ha we as a community have to m find a way to give you back some value. In money, in recognition, in, I don't know, we need to think about. I mean, Peter Hunter is driving this experience with the Physiom Journal, whereas actually you, you get by, by sharing uh, a model in this case, but the same logic can apply to that as a collection, you get an extra publication, sort of, which can be uh, indexed and et cetera. Uh, I don't know, we need to think about something like this because the next few are critical. If mm -hmm. we open the drawers and have all this data shared, the thing will jump. I mean, think mm -hmm. what happened uh, to all the musculoskeletal biomechanics when uh, uh, the Niger and Challenge data set were, were made available. In a few years, that area improved uh, enormously. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, that, that is very important to me. I, 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 I think we, we have to reflect on this as a new community. I think that's uh, uh, a very good, yeah. good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this yeah. is, uh, yeah. Also because think people are coming yeah. in. <laughs> 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 Thank you so yeah. much for your uh, valuable answers and your uh, precious insights. Um, and I uh, would like to give you the option, if you have something else that you'd like to share, you could uh, do so now. Um, otherwise, we'd like to come to an end with the interview, if that's... Yeah, I would like to thank uh, the counselor of the European Society of Biomechanics, Marcus Seller, in front of me, <laughs> 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 for, this, for this award, uh, which really, really is very important to me. I, 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 I will never stop saying this. And, uh, you know, for for the joy that this community gave me for 30 years in my career. Keep up the good work. Okay, <laughs> then we'd like to thank you again for yeah, this interview. thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to point out that the interview will be available on the YouTube channel, so we'll upload this video, and we hope you'll uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And my mom will be delighted. <laughs> 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 thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you.